Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise God. God bless you. Glad to be with you once again today as we look at the word of the Lord. I want to thank uh, those of you who are joining us uh, from around the world in our World Bank group Bible study. I ask God's blessings upon you, of course, as well as those uh, for whom this Bible study uh, is directly uh, presented to. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for your word that is life to us, the word that saved us, the word that heals, the word that delivers, even Jesus Christ, the living word who came to die, that we through him may be saved. I pray that the word of the Lord will save, heal, deliver. I pray that the spirit of God will give us understanding give people revelation in the knowledge of you open the eyes of the understanding to behold wonderful things in your word that will transform them into the image of jesus christ thank you for healing that will manifest thank you for breakthroughs through the seed of the word bringing harvest we give you praise for salvation from sin from sickness and all the effects of sin in Jesus name amen amen well praise God praise God glad to be with you again today as we study the word of the Lord together wherever you are joining us from God bless you God's word is life God's word will change your life Today we're looking at activating your faith, your faith in God. I want to look at it in two ways. We're going to look at the fact that uh, the faith that we have is actually the Lord's own faith. It's the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ that he has given to us. That's one. But two is faith as you believe in God, faith as you taking God at his word, faith as in you saying, not my way, God's way. You get that? Not what I think, but what God thinks. Not how uh, I would do it, but how God works and how God would do it. So you look at it from God's perspective, and you see that God is faithful. He's not a man to lie. God will do what he has said he would do. He's proven himself. Uh, he's given us a track record of his, of his faithfulness in that he has never lied to anybody. He's always done what he promised to do. And so uh, when you look at the history of God's faithfulness. It gives you the assurance that when you trust him with your life, with anything, he will help you with it. So that's what we're learning, you know, because it's important that we walk by faith. It's important that we activate our faith. I mean, walking by faith, walking is an activity. So when the Bible talks about, you know, walking by faith in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, there's some activity, there's some operation, something one has to do. And that's what we're looking at. To choose to turn from self, depending on yourself, trusting in man, to trusting in God, to do the impossible, to do what only God does. Marvelous things, amazing things, that is faith. Amen. So activating your faith in God. Let's start from Mark chapter 11. Mark 11. 
So welcome again. And we're looking at activating our faith in God. So Mark 11, and let's just go directly to where we have the matter of expressing faith in God, which is verses 22 to 24. Mark 11, 22 to 24. So it reads, Jesus answered them, have faith in God. So this is our Lord's talking. What he told his disciples, he's telling us also. To have faith in God. To exercise faith in God. Amen. It also means to have God's kind of faith, which is the first aspect that I explained today. That We're looking at faith as in God's faith that he gives to us. It's not something that we try to generate in our strength, but it's that which comes from God to us. But the other aspect of faith that's also important is our choosing. You have to choose God instead of yourself. Choose life, not death. Look at things from God's perspective. Expect God to work and not try to do things in your own strength. Amen. Because, you know, yeah, God created the heavens and the earth by his power, his glory. God can do any and everything. But it won't work for you if you don't trust him. It won't work if you don't come to him. So there, there are two aspects of faith. That which God just does by himself, gives to us. And he says, just live in this. And as believers, we live in his faith. We live in his power. We live in his life. Amen. Then there's the other part of obedience. You know, choosing to say, okay, not my will, but your will. Our Lord himself did that, Jesus. Amen. Not my will, Lord, your will. Not my way, your way. Amen. That's also faith. And that, that's in Hebrews. We'll, we'll see. But it's in Hebrews 11 and, and verse 6. It says, he that comes to God. So that's the coming aspect is what I'm talking about. That's faith. He that comes to God must believe that he is. He is God. See? And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Well, are we seeking God? I mean, whom are we seeking? Are we seeking men to help us? Are we depending on our strength? Because scripture tells us it's not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. Mountains will be removed. Barriers will fall. That's from Zechariah chapter 4. It means it's not by our mental ability or our physical prowess. But by God's spirit, God's power, God's grace, God's love. He saves us. He heals us. He helps us. God loves us with perfect love. That when we were against him, when we were sinners, Christ still came to die for us. That's unconditional love. Amen. And this God has given us his faith through Jesus. But you have to say, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I trust in you. And after you've believed in him, trusted in him, and gotten born again, you have to continue to live by his righteousness. Live by his faith. Live by his word. Amen. So let's let's look, dig into this and unpack this beautiful truth in Mark 11, verse 22. Jesus answered them, have faith in God, for truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, 
but believes that what he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. That's he or she. It doesn't matter, you know, the gender is just saying that child of God will have what he's saying. Amen. 24. Therefore, I say to you, what things soever you ask when you pray, you're asking at the time you're praying. Believe that you receive them when at the time you prayed and you will have them. I'm sure some of you know the difference that there's a point of having already received. That's different from receiving it or having it in the natural or manifested later. You need to see that distinction. When do we receive from God? We receive by faith at the time of prayer, when we pray. We don't receive when it physically manifests or naturally comes to pass. We have to believe that God who loves us has done it for us, has given it to us. And in fact, thank him for it. Amen. That's, what, no, no, that's an aspect of it. Thank God for giving you that thing that you need, you desire, you prayed about, which is according to his word, which he had promised you. Are you following this? So we're looking at activating our faith in God. Let me take you, I'm going to come back to Mark 11. There's a lot to unpack here. But I want to take you to 1 John 5. 1 John 5. And this is in connection with prayer. I just talked about it. But I need for you to see God's word with me. 1 John 5. Now let's read from verse 14. 1 John 5, 14. And 15. All right, praise God. So let's have, you know, one of the World Bank staff, please type it in so that, you know, you know, some of you come in late, you see the scriptures and you'll be able to follow. So kindly type in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Thank you so much. Now, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This applies to all of us. Uh, those who work, work at the World Bank for your jobs, your promotion, uh, things going on at work, you know, this applies to you, but it applies to everybody regarding anything. All right, so let's learn, you know, you're going to pray, you find a scripture or promises from God's word relating to that thing that you're praying about. Let's see what God says about it. In First John 5, 14, it says, this is the confidence, confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, look at the condition. There's a condition. We're not just asking, you know, but we are asking according to his will. Anything. All things that agree with God's will. The problem is, how do you know God's will? How do you find God's will? Let's answer it this way. How do you know somebody's will? Somebody's will is what they have written down. Somebody's last testament and will is what they wrote down. What somebody wills is what they've told you, what they've said. So we can find God's will in what is written in the Bible. 
in what is called the Old Testament and the New Testament. For most of us believers, Old Testament, New Testament. The Torah or the, the uh, Hebrew Bible as well as the New Testament. All right? That is Matthew 2, the Revelation. That would be New Testament. I'm cautious about explaining that because there's actually a difference between like the law of Moses, which is God's covenant with the people of Israel. That's actually different from Genesis to Malachi. The, the scriptures, Genesis to Malachi, that's not the law of Moses. So that's why I was, you know, I took my time to explain that. So there are things written from Genesis to Malachi that you can learn and it will profit you. It's written for your learning. It will bless you. You can apply the principles there to your life as a believer in Christ. But over there, you're going to also find God's covenant with the people of Israel. As a non-Israelite, you are not never a part of it. So we're not going to really bother ourselves with that aspect of the law and just keep talking about stay away from the law. That's, that's not for Gentiles. That was for Jews. All right? Okay, so I pray you catch that. Praise the Lord. Now, in 1 John 5 and verse 14, it says, This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, which is his word, what is written in both the Old Testament as Genesis to Malachi, as well as New Testament, Matthew to Revelation. I hope you caught that. He hears us. We have the confidence that as long as we're asking God according to his word, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, look at verse 15. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know, we are confident that we have whatever we asked of him, whatever. Wow. God will hear you. God will answer you. And bear with me, World Bank staff and those who are joining us, bear with me to talk a little bit about this aspect of God hearing all of us. We live at a time uh, and in a generation of believers where unfortunately some believers think that God hears only the pastor. That unless they contact a prophet and the prophet prophesies over them and does something for them, they would not get a breakthrough. That's not true. That is not true. Don't let anybody put you in bondage. And don't believe because I said it. Believe because the Bible says it. We're learning about activating our own faith in God. Amen. Not faith in a person to do something for you, but faith in God. Go to God. Learn to go to God instead of to your bishop or the archbishop or the prophet. Or you know, And this has nothing to do with the great men and women of God. We love them. We appreciate them, support them, receive from them, and go on with the things of God. But the mistake is this. We live in a generation now where people look to humans more than activating faith in Christ. Activating faith in God. They have faith in a person, in a prophet, in a man of God, in a woman of God. They have faith that God will do it if somebody prays. Instead of believing that God will do it for them when they pray. Believe me, God will hear you. God will answer you. God loves you. If you have a challenge now in your career at the World Bank, or for those listening to me, you can pray yourself and God will hear you. Of course, I don't mind praying for you or agreeing with you in prayer. 
No, not at all. I can agree with you in prayer for a marital breakthrough and God will bring harmony and peace in your marriage. I can agree with you in prayer for your healing and God will bring healing to you. And I don't mind doing that. But I beg of you, you need to have faith in God yourself. What if you, when you call me, I'm unavailable? I am busy and you can't get me. And you desperately need a breakthrough from God. You can go to God yourself. Where our subject is activate your faith in God. Your faith in God. You need to have faith in God. Amen. Some people have faith in some other religions. I'm talking about having faith in Jesus Christ. Having faith in the living God. The true one and only Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That, that's a, that God I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, you know, polytheism, the worship of different gods. No, 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 no. I'm talking about one God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, who loves you with perfect love. Amen. So we have seen that in order to have confidence, that God will hear us and answer us. We need to find his will. Which is his word. And the will of the Lord. Like somebody's last will and testament. Is what they wrote down. Or recorded. Say on a video. So God's will is what he has said. God's will is what is written. And what is written I mean from Genesis. All the way to Revelation. What is written. You will find things that God has promised, God has said, God has commanded. If you live by them, God will back you up. Because God's not promised <laughs> to confirm my word or your word or my desire, your desire. He's promised to confirm his word. Amen. He's promised to keep his word to us. Amen. Let's go back, please, to Mark 11. Mark 11. And we're going to read 22 to 24 again. After we read it, we're going to ask ourselves this. Why did Jesus even teach this at this point? What occasioned it? What caused it? What made him teach this at this time? So let's read again, Mark 11, 22 to 24. Jesus answered them. See, there's an answer. So we have to go to find what the question they asked him for which they got this answer or for which he gave them this answer. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Literally, it means have God's kind of faith. Have God's kind of faith. All right, for truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, so the mountain here for us, spiritually speaking, will be a problem. It will represent something that is a barrier, a hindrance, a position, something that is against you and against God's will for your life. Something that is in opposition to you and to God. Are you following? Very quickly, let me read this scripture to you. In 2 Corinthians 10, I'm coming right back to uh, Mark 11. But, you know, I, I am a teacher of the word so I like to go to scriptures to explain scriptures. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. So we have weapons. Look at that. Weapons of our warfare. They are spiritual. And they are mighty through God. Not through us. 
but through God. But they are weapons God has given to us. And they work powerfully and mightily by the, through God, by the power of God. All right? To do what? To the pulling down of strongholds. Ah, so there are what the Bible calls strongholds in life. Mountains, impediments, barriers, fortifications, structures that Satan has set up against people. Spiritual structures against peace of mind, peace and harmony in marriages. Their health, their promotion, their advancement in life. Look at that. And we have weapons that are mighty through God to the what? Pulling down of strongholds. So strongholds that are there can be pulled down by you. See, this is an area where people are going to tell you it's only special ministers who can do this. That's not true. You can do, you're a finance person in the World Bank. You can do this yourself. You don't have to be a pastor to be able to do this. You're an economist at the World Bank. You don't have to be a pastor, a prophet before you can do this. You just have to be born again. Pull down, the pulling down of strongholds. Then what else? Casting down. Casting down. So there's a structure and you can pull it down, cast it down, hurl it down. But what are we casting down? He said, imaginations. Whoa, imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So imaginations, this is an imagination, it's a picture that Satan paints for you, and you see it. You imagine this horror. You imagine this demise. You imagine this defeat. You imagine, you know, something bad. Satan is painting these pictures and harassing your mind. Man, you wake up and you are worried. You go to bed, you're anxious. You know, those things. That's warfare. And you have weapons. You have them. Mighty through God to use to bring that mountain down. To speak to the mountain as we saw in Mark 11. Again, speak to it yourself. Before you pick the phone to call me or you text me and say, Pastor Jackson, could you pray for me? I would rather you pray first yourself. Then you call me and you say, Oh, Pastor, the Bible says one will chase a thousand. I just chased a thousand, but two will chase ten thousand. I need for you to agree with me, so we'll chase ten thousand. That will excite me, and we'll do it together. Amen. But learn, ladies and gentlemen, learn to pray yourself before you go to church to pray. Pray at home. Amen. Pray first. Call on the Lord. He will hear you. He will answer you. And watch this. You can cast down that imagination, that picture. So whatever is evil and negative that Satan is showing you, that picture, that imagination, that's warfare. It didn't start from you. No, 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 no. And it's not God's will for your life. That's from the devil. It's warfare. And you have weapons that you need to use. Don't just sit there and say, oh, well, you know, God loves me. Que sera, sera, whatever would be, let it be. If God wants me to have it, God will do it. Hey, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that at all. Because God says, God wanted you to have it. That's why he gave it to you. He wants you to raise that child. He didn't give the child to you to, to pluck away that little flower and plant that flower in heaven, as people say in, at funerals when children die. No, no. You need to resist the devil. Say, my child will live and not die. Do whatever you can do. Medical help, get it. Pray. Command the sickness to leave. Do whatever you can do to help that child be healed physically. If they're going through mental problems, get help. 
speak against it, pray against it, get help. But don't start picturing a funeral where some minister is going to say, the Lord has plucked the beautiful flower and planted it in heaven. And it is God, you know, since he is God, it is God's will that goes. So, well, what can we do? People say that all the time. Well, you know, it's God's will. What can we do? That is, that is bad theology. That is bad teaching. And it makes people, you know, have some bitterness, anger in their hearts towards God. But because he's God and they're afraid of him, you know, they don't really excite it and they stop walking with God. You shouldn't do that. Rather, you should learn to trust God for grace, which is his power to break asunder the gates of brass and the bars of iron. Grace is God's power to set you loose and free, to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. A lot of Christians have limited God's grace to what people teach as undeserved favor. No, no, that's, it's more, it's more, it's more, it's more. Grace is God's power to do for you what you can do for yourself. It is power to stop sin. He says, where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. What's that saying? Grace is God's power to stop sin. Praise the Lord. Even Jesus, when he was on earth, he had grace. Do you want to tell me Jesus sinned? He never sinned. Do you want to tell me Jesus is a sinner? Do you want to apply grace as undeserved favor to Jesus? We cannot apply grace defined as undeserved favor to Jesus. We cannot do that. Yet when Jesus was on earth, the Bible says he had grace. In Luke chapter 2, it says Jesus had grace. God gave him grace. What does that mean? Is it undeserved favor? No, 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 sir. It is not undeserved favor. It is the power of God. It is the power of God that lifts you up. It is the power of God that strengthens you. When our Lord Jesus prayed, it says angels came and strengthened him. He prayed and angels came and strengthened him. The same will happen to you. That is grace. That is grace. That is favor. That is God's power released to make you who you are called to be. Oh, you need to learn to activate your faith. 2 Corinthians 10, he said, You have weapons which are mighty through God to pull down strongholds, to cast down imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What's the knowledge of God? What is revealed in the Bible, in the Word. So if there's a word, a thought, that Satan is fighting your mind with, and you know this is not what God says, Ladies and gentlemen, right there and then fight back. Speak back. Speak the word of God. Amen. Talk to it. We're going to go back to Mark. We're going to see it. But let me finish here. He says, and bring every thought. See the thoughts I'm talking about? <laughs> bring every thought into captivity. To the obedience of Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tell that voice, you need to obey the word of God. Talk to it and tell it to obey the word of God. Now let's go back to Mark 11 and we're going to see this. It's fascinating, ladies and gentlemen. It's amazing. Why did Jesus answer his disciples? Let's go. Let's look at it. Mark 11, remember we saw in verse 22, he said, Jesus answered them. Have faith in God or have God's kind of faith. You know, the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.20, he said, the life I live, it is not I, but Christ who lives in me. And this life I live now, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So live your life by his faith. You know, choose him. And let him live his life-given life in you. Life-transforming life in you. Supernatural life in your natural life. Yoke-destroying anointing released into your life daily. Amen. So, Mark 11. I love this. He said, truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain... That same mountain we saw in 2 Corinthians 10 is called an imagination. It's called a thought 
that is against God. A weapon that is against you. Warfare that's against you. That is a mountain. The obstacles, the strongholds, the imaginations. You have to say to them. Don't just think it and be quiet. You need to talk. You need to speak. The spirit of faith is released through speech. Let me repeat it. You can type it. The spirit of faith is released through speech. Somebody type it so it will bless somebody. The spirit of faith is what? Released through speech. If you want a scripture for it, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. Let's have World Bank staff, please, kindly type that. The spirit of faith is released through speech. And the reference, uh, if you could type it for us, Sister Eva, 2 Corinthians 4.13. We have in the same spirit of faith. So faith is spirit. We have the same spirit of faith. According as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Ladies and gentlemen, 2 Corinthians 4.13 teaches us that faith is a spirit. And what we believe, we speak. Don't just think it. Speak it. Act on God's word. Amen. Faith is released. The spirit of faith is released through speech. You speak by faith, it will happen. With our hearts we believe, with our mouth we confess. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The word of faith which we preach to you is near you. What you're listening now, you're hearing it, God's word. It's in your heart, in your mind, in your heart. That if you speak it, you will have it. Christ has done it for you already. But you have to say, I want it. I receive it. I thank you for it. Amen. So watch this, please. Three times in Mark 11, 22 to 24, the Lord Jesus says to say, say, say. Man, this is amazing. He says, whoever says to this mountain and tell it, be removed and thrown into the sea. Because the sea is the only place you can bury a mountain. If you want to hide a mountain, you can't hide it on a plane. The only place is in the ocean. Basically, what he's saying here is that I don't want this problem to ever arise again. In other words, I'm not dealing with the symptoms. I'm going to the root of it. I'm dealing with it at the root. Be removed, be gone, that's it. Amen. This teaching, this teaching, ladies and gentlemen, was occasioned by this, this event. Jesus is going by with his disciples and Jesus sees a fig tree. It had leaves on it. So the assumption was this. Once it has leaves, and actually back there, with it will have some pots as well. So these leaves and these pots would be an indication to Jesus that it has fruit. Jesus goes to it. There's no fruit. And strangely, because it's quite strange, because it's uncharacteristic of Jesus to do what he did next. He cursed the fig tree. He cursed it. It's very uncharacteristic of him. He's always blessing, never curses. So you're like, wait a minute, what's going on here? But before I come back to it, when he cursed it, he said, he said specifically exactly what he wanted. And that's what we're learning. When you're activating faith, the spirit of faith speaks. You have to say exactly what you want. Don't waffle. Say what you want. Amen. Jesus said, no man eat fruit of thee forever from this moment onward. Now, the strange thing is this. It's strange that he cursed it. But another thing is that he spoke to a tree. He spoke. 
I mean, who talks to trees? He spoke to a tree. Usually we talk to people. Jesus spoke to a tree. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on? I remember the first day that the Lord gave me this revelation. This is how I started. It began bothering me. And then he said, look at it. I answered it. It says, I answered it. And then the Lord asked me, when do you answer somebody? You answer someone when they pose a question to you. You answer or you respond when somebody speaks to you. Oh, I was shocked, ladies and gentlemen. I was shocked. I was like, what? That tree was speaking to Jesus? I'm not making this up. Let's read it. It, it is strange. It is weird, man. There are some weird things in life. <laughs> but for the scriptures, I would have said, oh, man, no, this is too much. But look at this. Mark 11 and verse, verse 12. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, having leaves, he came if perhaps he might find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. So when he saw the fig tree afar off, in the island that time, he sees a fig tree and it, it has leaves. So it is an indication to him that it has fruit. That, that's why he told us it had leaves. But it had no figs. Watch verse 14. Mark eleven fourteen, And Jesus answered. Answered and said unto it. Answer. You only answer somebody who has spoken to you, who has said something to you. So evidently, in the spirit realm, Jesus knew this tree is talking to him. You know, this is, I mean, it's just, it's weird. The fact is that Jesus answered it. And you only answer when somebody talks to you. The same answer that we have in verse 22. And Jesus answering said to his disciples. You only answer when somebody says something to you. So Jesus said, no man eat. Jesus answered and said to it. No man eat fruit of you hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. If you are one of his disciples, wouldn't you think that's kind of odd? You're like, whoa, the Lord just spoke to that tree. Ho, 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 man, what's going on? Let's go to verse 20. The next morning, as they passed by, they all saw the fig tree dried up. The fig tree dried up 24 hours overnight. Less than 24 hours even. Nighttime, 12 hours. You know, next morning, the fig tree is dried up. And the Bible makes sure to tell us in verse 20, from the roots. From the roots. When you want something to be removed so you don't see the, a mountain to be removed so you don't see it ever again, you bury it in the sea. You tell it to go into the sea. That's the lesson. Deal with things not at the surface, not at fruit level, but at root level. If you don't want to keep dealing with a problem over and over, get to the root of it. What is the spirit behind it? What is Satan's intention? What is going on here? Deal with it at the root. So Jesus spoke to it, cursed it to perish from its roots up. 
So Peter, remembering, said, Master, look, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. And Jesus responds to him, Peter, have faith in God or have the kind of faith that answers something that's talking to you, defying you, disrespecting you, coming against you. In Jesus' case, he was hungry. And the tree he had created to serve his need, Satan is using it as an affront to him in his face, telling him, I defy you. I will not provide what you made me for. Well, then why are you occupying the ground? You're wasting the ground. It needs to be removed. For those of you in the World Bank, if something's attacking what you eat, because Jesus was hungry, let's apply it spiritually in its significance. Jesus is hungry. He needs to eat. So whatever may be attacking your livelihood, speak to it at its roots. Did you catch that? Start blessing your career. On Monday mornings when you have had a great weekend, you're going to go to work. Never say, oh my God, I got to go back to this God forsaken job. Oh, I hate this place. Oh, this horrible. No, don't join those who talk like that. You work there. Bless that place. Same as countries. Do you know a lot of people curse their own countries? Oh, this God forsaken country. As for this country, mm, this country, they get into politics and they are always cursing, you know, their country. When in Jeremiah 29, God said to the Jews, into whichever city you enter, pray for the peace of that place because it is in the, the, the peace thereof that you will be blessed. We've learned a lot today about activating our faith. And I want us to pray and activate our faith in God by speaking blessings over our lives. Whatever is attacking what gives you food to eat, Jesus needed to eat. Whatever is attacking that, speak to it. Whatever is attacking your body, speak to it. You know, in Matthew 15, there's a place where it says that whatever tree God did not plant should be removed. So that's another lesson. Whatever God did not plant in your body, a growth that the doctor just found, speak to it. Every morning, speak to it. Every night, speak to it. Curse that growth to perish in Jesus' name. Do that yourself. You say, I curse this growth to die, this tumor to die in Jesus' name. Whatever that your body needs, speak life. You say, I speak life to my organs. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray that my blood pressure be regularized, normalized. Are you with me? Because faith is released through what? Speech. That's how you activate your own faith in God. Who is the author of your faith? He gave you faith. And when you study his word, his word brings faith in your heart. You speak it. You pray it. You confess it. It will come to pass. Let us pray. I touch and agree with God's people. Right now. And in Jesus' name, we curse symbolically that fig tree that is speaking against them. That fig tree that is standing against them. We curse it to perish from its roots in Jesus' name. I curse cancerous cells to die in the name of Jesus. I curse tumors to die, to shrivel and leave bodies in Jesus' name. I curse cancer. I curse tumors. I curse every life germ of disease to perish in Jesus' name. What? Ever is risen stronghold against God's people, mountains, barriers. I command that mountain to be buried in the sea. That is to be gone, that they see it no more. In Jesus' name, be healed in your body. 
In Jesus' name, that thing which threatens your career, what your livelihood, I speak to it and I command it to be removed in Jesus' name. And I speak grace to you, grace to you. The power of God give you your breakthrough. The power of God bring you salvation from sin, salvation from sickness, salvation from fear, from confusion, from bondage in Jesus' name. Now, the blessing of the Lord be on you, be in your home, be on your marriage if you are married, be on your relationships, be on your children, be on your family or grandchildren, be upon you to give you strength, health, peace in Jesus' name. Be blessed today and may you be a blessing to others for God's glory. Anyone listening who has never given their heart or life to Jesus, who died for your sins and was raised up for you, when you become righteous, is when you can start living his faith life. You can say, Lord Jesus, I receive you today. You died for my sins. I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Thank you, Father, for making me your child. I'm born again. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. Watch over you. In Jesus' name, amen. If I don't see you till next year those who work in the world bank well merry christmas to you god bless you obviously from in january we'll be live uh, in person uh, at the world bank bible studies all right so god bless you we'll have one more session next week and then we'll break for christmas god bless